I had the, have the pleasure of talking to you a little bit about a, a topic that uh, is um, pretty big in terms of what we do as cardiologists. It's a big part of what we offer here at Memorial Hospital uh, in terms of heart, managing heart disease. And um, it's, a, it's a huge national problem as well. Um, so I'm going to go through these, this little slide presentation. I've tried to pirate out the, the, the things that would, would make you bored and go to sleep. Uh, try to keep it from being too, too heavy in, in data. And I want you to come out of this understanding a little bit about, a little bit about how the heart functions. Uh, that's important in terms of knowing how to understand what happens when the heart's not working well. And then a little bit about uh, what we have to offer in terms of the treatment for heart, heart failure. And, uh, and then I can answer some questions at the end. The microphone they have on is for the video, so I apologize. You have to kind of bear with me, and if you can't hear or you have, a, have not understanding something, I can stop. So I'm a cardiologist in the, the Heart and Vascular Center here at Memorial Hospital, part of the Memorial Medical Group. Uh, I have developed some special interest in heart failure over the last few years that had several co aspects of uh, inter combined interest in what we do as, as general cardiologists. Um, it sort of, my, my personal interest grew in it uh, as a result of a couple of patients who were sort of at the end of the road and uh, there wasn't much to offer them here in Lake Charles. Now that's, that's actually a big statement because we offer most everything there is uh, to offer in cardiology uh, today with very few exceptions. But these two patients had some really serious problems. They were at basically at the end of life and I had to get them to, uh, into a situation that, that we, we could offer them something that, that's uh, big, big time therapy and, and most people consider that to be heart transplantation. Those patients end up going to, to Houston and then later to, to my college roommate up at, uh, who's the chief of cardiac transplant surgery at Duke. And both of them had devices implanted. One of them got a transplant. Both did real well. And during that same time course, about two years ago, my, uh, my son went up and spent the year with um, my, my roommate. And um, a lot of talking and collaboration and it developed some, some more interest. As part of that, or, uh, or as a, as a uh, continuum of that, I felt like that there was a lot to be offered uh, to patients in our area uh, that were, was not being offered, uh, and that we in Southwest Louisiana, and Louisiana as a whole, ought to have the access to the finest and, and most advanced therapies for, for anything, but certainly heart failure, uh, just like the people that live in River Oaks in Houston. And uh, so that's the whole, that's the, the, the underlying theme of our, the development of our program. Um, so I'm going to visit with you a little bit about that. I, I'm the director of the heart failure clinic. We have a, a very involved heart failure clinic that, that uh, allows us to, to make available therapies for advanced heart failure to all aspects of our population. Uh, and it's something that we'll continue to, to develop and I'll kind of give you a little background of that uh, as we go. So what is congestive heart failure? You'll see, it, you'll see it referred to as CHF. That's the abbreviation for it. So the technical definition, congestive heart failure is a clinical syndrome in which the heart is unable to pump sufficient blood to meet the metabolic requirements of the body, as in brain, arms, leg, kidneys, intestinal system, or can do so only under adverse conditions. And I'll clarify this for you in just a few minutes. Let's see if I can get this. Uh... Now this is a neat little graphic display that uh, is courtesy of the American Heart Association. And I pulled it up for, uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, but one is I want you to understand a little bit about what the, the heart does. First off, the heart is a muscle, and you can see they've drawn this, this, this diagram, and this kind of pinkish tissue is all muscle tissue. Muscle, very similar to the muscle in your arms and legs, few differences, but 
the essence of it is that it's a muscle, and that's important to remember. Another facet of this is that most people's conception of the heart is that the heart itself gets its blood supply by the blood that is being pumped out of this big, big pumping chamber. And that isn't exactly correct. The, the heart itself has blood supply that comes, the part blood has to be pumped out of the heart, and then it has little arteries that come off of the aorta, that's this big artery here, and then little arteries that run out over the surface of the heart muscle that supply the heart. And those little arteries are called the coronary arteries. Those are the arteries that block off and, and are associated with heart attacks. And when those little arteries that run on the surface of the heart block off, the heart muscle tissue that's supplied by them, that's this tissue here, will then subsequently die if nothing's done pretty quickly. We think the best approach to heart attacks is within about the first 90 minutes. But my point in bringing it up is so that you understand that the heart is a, a muscle, that it has its own blood supply, that it is not getting blood from the chamber of the heart that it's full of blood that's supplying the rest of the body. There are two sides to the heart. There's a right and a left side of the heart. Now, anytime we look at pictures of patients or parts of the body, we're looking at them as though we're facing the patient. So even though this is the left side of the screen, this is the right side of the heart. And it's represented in blue because the right side of the heart collects blood coming from all the veins in the, in the body, all over the place. Returning blood to the, right side, to the right side of the heart, the right side of the heart pumps the blood to the lungs. When, a, when the blood gets to the lungs, it collects oxygen. It then flows over to the, right, to the left side of the heart. And then the left side of the heart is sort of the business end of the heart. It pumps the oxygenated blood out to the rest of the body. And it does that going through this big artery called the aorta. And the aorta has all the branches going to every, every part of the body. And this makes a big circle. So the body, the, the aorta delivers the blood to your arms and legs and your brain, delivers the oxygen to the tissues. The blood then goes back into the veins and it makes another trip. Back to the right side of the heart, back to the lungs, more oxygen, and then back to the left side of the heart and it's a continuum. So the heart is a, is, is a two-sided pump that is in one big circuit, one big circle of movement. The problem comes when the heart muscle gets weak, and this, this picture shows you a little bit, you notice a little bit of a difference between the two. But particularly on the left side of the heart, you'll notice how the, how the thickness of this wall has diminished substantially compared to this and that the chamber of the heart has enlarged. Now that enlargement occurs because your the rest of your body demands a constant amount of blood flow. And if, if a part of the heart muscle starts to fail to work, then something has to happen to maintain that constant blood flow to the rest of the body. And then what happens is, well, if, if it's gonna pump out 50% of what, it, what it's full, full of, then, the, then the, what it's full of has to get bigger so that the total amount of blood flow to the rest of the body stays the same. So when the heart muscle gets weak, the heart dilates and enlarges up to a point so that your body can maintain constant blood flow. So now that's a quick lesson in anatomy and a little bit of physiology. And so now we'll take a test at the end of the, at the, end of the talk and if you pass, then you can leave. <laughs> This, this little dynamic graph just shows you how the heart pumps. And you'll notice that, the, that both, of the, both the right and the left side of the heart are pumping at the same time. That's so that all the mechanical activities happen in proper order. You can also notice that the heart will thicken this way in this axis. It also shortens, as you see in this particular diagram, it's shortening more than it is narrowing. So now what happens when part of the heart muscle doesn't, doesn't work? Well, it just doesn't pump. It's sitting there doing nothing. And when this happens, well, it didn't change, though. 
there. Now you can see that this whole little zone of the heart is not moving at all. And this is the kind of thing you would see after someone's had a heart attack. And what's having to happen is that this remain, the remaining normal tissue is having to do double time, number one. And number two, you notice that the heart enlarged. And that's all so that the amount of blood flow going out of the heart can remain the same. And we see these, th this phenomenon for a lot of different reasons uh, on a daily basis. So who cares about when the heart gets weak and there's, the heart fails so it's not capable of pumping blood to the rest of the body like it's supposed to? Well, a lot of people care. 5.7 million adults in the United States presently. About one in nine of the deaths per year, a little greater than 10% per year, are attributable to congestive heart failure. Now, this is, this is a different figure than heart disease as a total. If you take that total in adults over 50, the total's 50%. But heart failure alone accounts for one in nine deaths in the United States. About 50% of the population of patients with heart failure will die within five years of the diagnosis. Now that's kind of a scary fact. And it's, it's this fact that has led to a lot of money being spent, time spent trying to develop ways to preserve heart function and find treatments for folks who, who have a weak heart. The cost, and when I did this, I, I thought about spelling this out, but that, the number of zeros here makes, <laughs> makes the point. So these numbers are actually from 2015. The number is actually of cost per year in the United States is about $37 billion today. And then you can imagine what that does for people who are trying to work, who are responsible to their families. A lot of missed days of work and think about owning a company. If you've got a person who's got heart failure, maybe it's somebody who's really, really important to your company. This has huge impact. So there are several ways that the heart can fail. And as our, if you recall, I told you that the left side of the heart is what we kind of think of as the business side of the heart. Left side of the heart carries that blood that's got oxygen in it, out, it pushes it out to the rest of the body. So the most common, commonly discussed kind of heart failure is left ventricular systolic heart failure. So the left side of the heart and systolic heart failure, systole is, the, is the, con, the part of the heart cycle when the heart contracts. So this implies that the heart function is poor. The left ventricular function is poor. But there are other kinds of heart failure. And actually, pretty recent data suggests that there are these other types of heart failure are just as common. People who have normal left ventricular pumping function, so the heart will squeeze normally, but unfortunately, it won't relax. And so there's restricted space for blood to fill and get pushed out. It actually is about half and half. And if you take it in total, it's about 28.6 million people uh, in the United States that have one or the other. And then you can have both sides of the heart fail, the right and the left side. The most common cause of the right side of the heart failing is that the left side of the heart fails. So what can cause this to happen? Well, I spent a minute talking to you about those little arteries that supply the heart muscle for a reason. Because ischemic heart disease is the most common cause of poor heart function. Ischemic heart disease is just fancy language for coronary artery disease or blocked arteries. Or, if you want to take it in its, in its biggest form, heart attack. So, Dead heart muscle because of heart attack or blocked arteries is the most common cause of left ventricular heart failure. Now this got a little bit, a little bit out of order because of my lack of techno savviness, but number two on that list would be valvular heart disease. And so I'm sure that some of you or, or many of you have heard of folks who have heart valve problems. Specifically, there's a valve called the aortic valve that is designed so that when the heart pumps blood out toward the rest of the body, the blood will go out, and then it won't turn around and come back and 
right where it came from. So that aortic valve opens, lets the blood out, it closes so the blood stays where it was going. Unfortunately, some people have an aortic valve that is slightly abnormal and over time wear and tear causes that valve to thicken and when it thickens it quits moving and then that valve becomes an obstruction to blood flow, puts a lot of pressure on the heart to push against that and over time can cause the heart to fail. That same valve can, instead of getting narrow, it can quit working like it's supposed to and allow the blood to turn around and go pouring back in the heart and that pours tons of extra volume on the heart so the heart has to accommodate that up to the point that it fails. And then there's a second valve that causes a lot of, pro a lot of people problems, it's the mitral valve. This particular valve is inside the heart designed so that when the heart pumps, the blood goes the normal direction, out of the aorta and not backwards to the lungs. In quite a few people, this valve will leak and if it does leak enough, it can cause the heart to fail. And then there's this group of people who have what we call diastolic heart failure. Now, this group of folks uh, have a much more nebulous condition, uh, and nebulous because we can't see with our eyes what, what really is going on very well. Their heart function appears normal. The heart contracts normally. The problem again, is, again, as I mentioned, that the heart won't relax. And when the heart won't relax, it's stiff, builds up pressure, and that pressure over time gets reflected back to the lungs and causes heart failure. The two principal causes of this are systemic hypertension, so just plain old hypertension as, as, as you know it, diabetes, and there's some other rare diseases that we call infiltrative diseases like amyloidosis and sarcoidosis, uh, hemochromatosis, and, and those, are, those are more rare conditions, things that we look for. And then there's the right side of the heart. And the right side of the heart can fail as well. The right side of the heart is kind of unique. In utero, babies don't need blood going to their lungs. And that's because they're connected by the umbilical cord to the mother. So the right side of the heart doesn't need to do as much work. It doesn't need to push blood to the lungs. And therefore, the right side of the heart is a little weaker than the left. In, in under normal conditions. And that just is a fact. That means that the right side of the heart then, then is a little more sensitive to things going wrong. The most common cause of the right side of the heart failing would be that the left heart fails. So it's just simply backing up pressure in the system. And that can occur because of heart attacks. It can because it be because of heart valve problems. There are abnormalities, disease states that cause elevation of the blood pressure around the lungs. And remember that I told you that this right heart is sensitive, more, much more sensitive than the left side, so it doesn't tolerate high blood pressure around the lungs very well. That can also happen in folks who have had clots go to their lungs. That raises the blood pressure around the lungs and can cause the right heart to fail. And then there's the, 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 the kitties who have congenital heart disease, structural problems that cause abnormal blood flow in the, in the, in the uh, cardiac circulation that then put a lot of pressure on the right heart. Not many people talk about this. This has become a more popular topic because of some of the therapies we have to offer uh, that are complicated by right heart failure. Now just a brief word about risk factors, and these are risk factors, <coughs> but they're risk factors specifically for heart artery disease. Remember, heart artery disease is the most common cause of congestive heart failure because blocked arteries are associated with heart attack, heart attack associated with poor muscle function. So what are those risk factors? Well, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, family history of, of heart artery disease. Now this, in technical terms, is folks under uh, primary relatives mother, father, brothers, and sisters with heart artery disease under the age of 55. Now, I think it would be a little fallacious to stand here and say that people who, if you have a family member or a handful of family members who had heart attacks at 60, that they don't, they're not included in this data. But technically, a primary relative under the, under the age of 55. 
sedentary lifestyle and or obesity. And if there were 10 risk factors for heart artery disease, the first five would be this right here. If you like playing with gasoline and matches, <laughs> mix your smoking with your high blood pressure and diabetes. Now this, is the, this, is, this discussion is not aimed at, at discussing risk factors, but obviously the best thing, best way to, 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 to deal with heart failure is to not get it. And the way to not get it is to don't get heart artery disease. So but remember those six risk factors if you remember nothing else. So what are the symptoms of heart failure? Now this is kind of tricky because the body is well equipped to deal with disease states and things not going right. In fact, it's extraordinarily well equipped. It's a very eloquent machine. And that makes it sometimes difficult for us to recognize what those symptoms might be. So here's a little list and I'm gonna go over this with you. This is a fancy word, dyspnea particularly on exertion. Well, dyspnea is a, short, is a fancy word for shortness of breath. So people who are short of breath with effort, that should be a, should be a, should be a, a really big red flag. If, if you've noticed that you're doing really well and then over the last six months, you've gone from being able to walk two or three, two or three blocks down to, man, it takes me some effort to make the bed. That's a serious problem. Orthopnea, is a fancy word for having to sleep upright. Most people can sleep flat in the bed. That, the way the body's designed, uh, the, the, the blood pressures within the cardiovascular system should not change substantially with you making significant position changes. But in some folks, particularly people who have a weak heart, they have a tendency to back fluid up toward their lungs and so they can't lay down. So some people notice that they have to put two or three pillows under their head to sleep at night over the last two or three months, a red flag. Here's another fancy word, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Again, there's a test at the end. <laughs> so <clears throat> paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, people abbreviate this PND in, in, in our world, but all in the world that means is having to wake up, you, have, you get suddenly awakened from sleep because you're short of breath. Have to sit up on the edge of the bed to catch your breath. Now that should alarm anybody, but you'd be surprised. Some people think, oh wow, it must be a bad day. Well, if this happens, and it happens every night, you better get seeing somebody who knows what they're doing because this, this, is, a, this is a really bad sign. And those three symptoms together would be what we call the classic symptoms for heart failure. Short of breath with effort, requiring that you sleep upright and waking up in the middle of the night shortness, with shortness of breath. Here's a really important aspect of it as well, exercise intolerance. I have patients come in every day of the week, probably half of them that I see are 70 years of, old, of age or older. Doc, I'm getting older, I'm a little short of breath, but don't worry about it, I understand, I'm getting old. Well, we don't make excuses, okay? And you can't walk around, it's not because you got older. It's because something's not right. It could be as simple as you're just not in really good shape. But if you know, you, you've been physically active and you notice that, hey, I used to walk a mile around the block every morning and man, when I go, go out to get the, get the mail, I, I can hardly make it to the mailbox. And I'm gonna have to stop, short of breath really serious sign, exercise intolerance. And you'll notice these are really subtle, kind of subtle things. You can see how that might, not, might escape your, your worry. But when taken together, that's serious business for us. That's a sign that something is not right. Now you don't need to panic. It could be that you're just not in good shape. Maybe you, maybe you liked Mardi Gras too much. You had too many crawfish and too much jambalaya and, it's, and, and, and we've, got, we've got to work on that. Yeah, blue man. <laughs> but these things are all subtle, subtle signs that there's something bad wrong. So another highlight to what I'm telling you today. These symptoms, shortness of breath, waking up in the middle of the night, short of breath, having to sleep on a bunch of pillows or in the recliner. You'd be surprised how many people think it's normal to go sleep in a recliner. 
can't walk. And here's some more symptoms that are, that are vague. Cough, fatigue, just don't have any energy. I don't want to eat. This is an interesting symptom. You get anorexia with a lot of diseases. You get, you get a bad cold, the flu, you don't want to eat. You don't feel good. Same thing applies to heart failure. The mechanism is just a little different. Your body over time starts to adjust to poor heart function and makes a lot of chemicals to try to balance all these bad things happening. But some of those chemicals have bad side effects. And there is a, an interesting chemical that's released. It's an, inf an inflammatory type chemical. It, it, it stirs up the immune system. It's called tissue necrosis factor. Again, there's a test at the end. <laughs> but that's, that chemical suppresses appetite. And so it's sort of a bad thing because what's, you, you have, your heart is not doing well. You're short of breath. You can't get around and do what you need to do. One of the things that you do need to do is get up and move around. But unfortunately, the way your body's responding to it, causing you not to eat, you start losing muscle mass. You get weaker. So you, you notice that you're not, you have no appetite and all this other stuff, it's a serious sign. Bloating, and then of course, a lot of people focus on this edema thing. The swelling in legs is, can be caused by lots of different things. And in the, in the, in the circuit, the, the cardiovascular circulation circuit, that's at the bottom of the, of the hill. Your gravity at, at, at the floor there. So this is a very nonspecific <coughs> symptom but if you have all these things and you're getting some swelling in your legs or you feel bloated, it could be that you're retaining water because your heart just simply can't move fluid through the system. Now these are things that, that uh, I don't see any residents or any of, the, any of the student doctors here, but these are things we look for, rattling in the lungs, a heart sound that's not normal, respiratory pattern that's not normal, the heart beating fast, Pulse being a little weak, please don't check your pulse. <laughs> the swelling and some other findings in liver enlargement. These are all things that we look for. So how can, you, how can, how can we test, do tests to look at what's going on here? Well, we have a, a neat tool that was developed over the last 40 years, uh, ultrasound. Just like ultrasound for when you go, when, when ladies are having, having children, want to see the baby, look at the, make sure the baby's healthy. Well, we can use that same technology as well as the same technology that you look at every morning when you turn on the weather channel. You got the Doppler radar. Well, we have Doppler radar too. <laughs> and it tell, this, te this tool, the echocardiogram, tells us, lets us see the heart muscle in motion. We can actually see the heart pumping. We can identify parts of the heart that don't pump well. And using our radar, we can see where blood's going and, and in what direction it's moving. Really neat stuff. This is, a, this is probably the primary testing tool that we use, is the echocardiogram. Probably a lot of you have had echo and might not know why, but that's, that's, that's what it's designed to do. Let's us see the heart function. It also lets us see heart structures and know that they're normal or abnormal. Cardiac catheterization is a procedure where we put a small IV in the artery, either in the groin or sometimes in the, in the, in the wrist. And from that access point, we can run up to the art those little arteries I was telling you about that supply the heart muscle with blood, put a little small catheter about two millimeter, one and a half to two millimeters in diameter, inject some contrast material and take x-ray picture. And we can see those arteries. And then if we see arteries, we, can, we have the opportunity to fix those arteries with stents or if, if things are bad enough, a bypass operation or something like that. We use chest x-rays, we use the lab, some simple tests can tell you a whole lot about what's going on. So that's just a still picture of an echo. I apologize, my techno savvy operation didn't allow me to uh, get this in motion. But this is, an, this is taking pictures from the apex of the heart, so down just under the breast. And you can see that this is the left ventricle. See that kind of thick tissue? That looks like sort of like that picture that I showed you. That, turned upside down, right? So this is the big pumping chamber of the heart here. This is the left atrium, one of the priming chambers. It's in this particular patient, it's massively enlarged. This is the right side of the heart, so the right atrium, and there's the right ventricle. And you see, incidentally, the difference between the size of the right side of the heart and the left. 
in that picture. This tool helps us a lot. Okay. So how do we how do we treat this? Well, so over the last 40 years, there's been tons of work because of those 30 to 40 billion dollars worth of cost to our economy and the cost of lives. People have been working nonstop trying to figure out ways to treat heart failure. So there's several things to consider when we today when we start treating heart failure. At the heart of that is using medical therapy, in other words, pills. And we use those under the guise of some guidelines. And so there are three major societies that, that publish data uh, year-round. In fact, once or twice a, a day, it seems like, somebody's releasing a, a study that involves heart failure. The American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, which is the society that the, all of our cardiologists belong to, and the American Society for Heart Failure. These three organizations are made up of largely the same people and have analyzed the continual development of data uh, and released guidelines for types of therapies that are the best to help people live longer. The good news is that with the development of all this stuff, the mortality associated with heart failure is actually declining. And there's some new therapies out that are very, very promising. ACE inhibition, an ACE inhibitor uh, is a drug that dilates arteries and it has some special n hormonal type effects that are associated with improving survival. And we learned this in the mid-1980s and since then this has been the, the mainstay of therapy for heart failure with medicine uh, to, up until about two years ago. It was the very best we had to offer. There's some side effects caused by these medicines, namely cough, and so somebody got the wise idea, well, let's change the molecule a little bit and see if we can stop the cough. And they came up with this one, angiotensin receptor blocker. By the way, these drugs are, are things like uh, lisinopril, captopril, enalapril, so things that you might recognize. The ones that stop the cough are some medicines like Losartan or Valsartan. Valsartan is Divan. Some people have had problems with that lately because it was recalled. This is a newer drug, and this is the this is the this is the real baby on the block, and it's it's also the giant on the block. So, make careful note of that, so you get past the test. <laughs> Angiotensin receptor blocker, naprilosin inhibitor. <laughs> so you see this one advertised on TV right now, and they always have a a neat little story about somebody who's got heart failure. And I encourage you to watch that video. That 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 little ad because it's actually very informative. And the name of this drug, it's one drug, uh, it's not a class, it is a class, but it, there is only one drug in the class, it's called Entresto, E-N-T-R-E-S-T-O, Entresto. And it is, a, it is the, probably the finest medical innovation in terms of pills that has occurred in 40, 40 years. It is associated with a dramatic reduction in mortality, it reduces the need to come to the hospital, uh, helps people feel better, long list of very, very positive effects. So, Entresto, and I would, again, encourage you to, to read about it. Beta blockers are drugs that slow the heart down. They're old as dinosaurs. And every time some, someone has studied the beta blockers, they learn something new, but in, in, the, in the late 90s, uh, there was a, a, the initial trial published uh, out of um, Brazil that showed that those old dinosaur drugs actually can help people live longer with heart failure. The aldosterone antagonist is a, is a type of fluid medicine that preserves potassium, so it helps the kidney eliminate water, but at the same time cause the, cause the kidney to re return potassium to the bloodstream. Kind of a nice effect because if you just take diuretics, you lose potassium. So if you take these top, these five things, all of these have been associated with improving survival. And they've all, this has all been data that's been developed over the last 40 years. Most people are familiar with Lasix or fluid, fluid pills. That falls under the category of diuretics. And we use those medicines to do exactly that, to get rid of fluid, treat the symptoms. When I first started in medical school, we had this, this cardiologist in New Orleans at, at LSU, and he had been 
practicing, I think, for 75 years at that point. And he practiced for another 50. <laughs> he didn't believe in a cath lab. He didn't believe in an echo. All he had was a stethoscope. And he had a few little things like diuretics and some digoxin. He used that. He thought that was the best thing there was. He just died. He was 99. Brilliant man. He published a big study uh, called the Bogalusa Heart Study, uh, obviously from Bogalusa. Very similar to the other major heart, heart, uh, study with heart disease called the Framingham Study, uh, which are landmark studies. Not many people, I bring it up just because it's an interesting fact that, that it was performed in Louisiana, looking at mortality from heart disease. But back to what I was telling you, these two drugs are used to treat symptoms, diuretics, and digoxin. Uh, they're, they're dinosaur drugs. They've been around forever. Digoxin, been around since the days of the pharaohs. You can grow this at home. Don't take it. <laughs> Don't eat the foxglove. That's what that is, foxglove. We can give some medicines intravenously that will help the heart pump better. And it can make you feel better for a short period of time. Unfortunately, we use those only in dire circumstances because while they will help you feel better, help the heart pump a little stronger temporarily, they're also associated with increasing mortality. So they're not something that we can, we can do for very long. There have been about a dozen more of these drugs like this developed, and every time they've been studied, that's the, that, that's the result. Revascularization, well, this is, this is restoring normal blood flow to, block, to, to a heart that has blocked arteries. And we do that using stents. You hear about stents all the time. You have a blocked artery, you have a heart calf, find the blocked artery, go put a stent. Re re reopen the artery. Coronary artery bypass surgery, or bypass surgery as people casually call it, was developed in the late 60s and kind of popularized in the 70s, and now it's done pretty routinely, um, is, the, is another way to do that. Uh, Repair damaged or, or narrow heart valves, like I was telling you. These are all things that are designed to Im improve a weak heart. If the heart function remains poor, we have to worry about heart rhythm disturbances because weak heart muscle tissue also does not perform its electrical functions. And when the electrical functions gets, get messed up, short circuit, you can have serious problems, life-threatening heart rhythm problems. And in a certain subset of patients, we have to pay attention to this if the heart function gets bad enough. But we have an answer. We can implant a device that's kind of like a pacemaker. Uh, it has a wire, goes down to the heart, and it simply babysits the heart. It sets and watch every beat every day. And if something goes haywire, the electrical signal gets scrambled, and you have a short circuit, then this thing can pace your heart out of that, out of that abnormal rhythm, or if it's, not, if it's not successful, it can actually shock your heart. It's almost like walking around with the emergency room. And it's small, size of two, two silver dollars stacked on top of each other. And it can be implanted right under the collarbone. Now here's some more fancy word, cardiac resynchronization. If you think back to that, 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 that dynamic picture I showed you where the right and left sides of the heart were moving together normally. When people develop heart failure, that synchrony gets disrupted. And the, the weakness of the heart muscle begets more weakness of heart muscle. And that's part of why, that dyssynchrony. Well, we've learned that in certain patients, we can resynchronize the right and left sides of the heart. And that requires a pacemaker that has generally four wires to it. Uh, it has a defibrillator wire and then three other wires that go to, the, to three areas of the heart so that we can electrically restore normal heart function uh, or near normal heart function. And it can help people live longer. And then these last two things, and nobody wants to, wants to think about having to go somewhere and have some major procedure performed, but this is the really cool stuff right here, this one left ventricular assist device. So we don't do that here in Lake Charles. And you think back to when Michael DeBakey was first uh, operating uh, on a large scale, they did bypass surgery. And then along about 1967, he was starting trying to develop an artificial heart. And if you actually ever go to uh, either Methodist or St. Luke's in Houston, um, they have several places where they've 
put some of those up on the wall to show you neat things. They got some examples of artificial hearts that they developed. Well, they didn't work, but that work, that research has continued, and the evolution of that is the left ventricular assist device. If, despite all of our great medicines, things are not going well and heart function is deteriorated to a point that we're, we're, we're not going to survive without something dramatic, the left ventricular assist device can be implanted. And simply, simply put, it's a pump. There's a, two different types, a rotary pump and an oscillating magnetic type pump that can be implanted on the apex of the heart. And that pump will supply, actually recreate normal blood flow to, for the rest of the body. So it's in, installed on the tip of the heart, and it has a tube that goes up to that big artery, the aorta, and it will pump about five liters of blood every minute, uh, just like your, heart, the, 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 your original heart would. Those things were big and bulky, but over the last 10 to 15 years, they've become much more manageable, and so they can be implanted. It has a, presently, they all have an exteriorized drive line, so there's a tube that comes out of the abdominal wall and connects to something just about like the size of a, uh, two cell phones. Put it on your waist and go about your business. And it's pretty neat. That sounds kind of crazy, but I have a, a little crew of patients that have gone to Houston and had those implanted at Methodist, uh, and they go elk hunting every year. Well, if you think about that, that's pretty amazing for somebody who was basically ridden, bedridden to the, to the extent that they were ready, ready, ready to go. Enough was enough. And this saved their life. And the original thought was that, that this would be a device that was a temporary thing, that we put the device in and hope, hope that a heart came along and you could have a heart transplant. But as, they, as these devices, ha devices have matured, some people have had these things in now for eight, ten years. And our, our hope is soon, like as in the next five years, that these devices will have matured to the point that they will not require an exteriorized drive line. So you're near in completely independent living with an artificial pump. Now, this is for the left ventricle. They actually, there actually is a device to put on the right side of the heart as well. Uh, that doesn't go as well statistically, but which would basically constitute a artif complete artificial heart. But that work all continues and is available through, through our heart failure clinic based on an association with the Methodist transplant program in Houston. And then there's cardiac transplantation, and that's sort of the, the, the end all of, of heart failure treatments. The unfortunate thing is that in 1990, uh, heart, for your heart transplantation reached its pinnacle at about 3,000, 3,200 cases uh, a year. And that went on for a few years, and it actually has declined down to about 3,000 per year. And it has not changed in 25 years. And the problem there is the availability of, of organs. And it's not just that people won't give, give a heart. It's, it's very complicated because the tissue matching has to occur, the viability of a heart uh, in Lake Charles, say somebody in Portland, Oregon needs a heart. Well, we, today we can't transport that heart in time to implant that in somebody. So the bottom line is we're kind of stuck at 3,000. Well, that's a pretty small number. Remember, we got 28 million people with heart failure. So that's where the, the, the research is going with these left ventricular assist devices uh, and will we'll probably be the mainstay of advanced heart failure before too long. So here's some good news. Heart failure is classified in, into four groups. Class 1, New York Heart Association Class 1, which is kind of minimal to, to no symptoms. Class 2, people who have routine activities that are minimally interfered with. But you go about your day and you climb some stairs and you get shorter breath. A little more, little more shorter breath than usual. And this is important because this is 70% of people who have heart failure. And unfortunately, if you remember that slide I showed you that, that roughly 50% of people will be, be gone five years after their diagnosis. And unfortunately, it includes these people too, who have very few symptoms. Very important that, you, that, that, that heart failure get recognized and treated appropriately in, in order to preserve life. 
And then there's class three and four, and these people are, can hardly do anything class three, class four are people who are bedridden. This chart basically shows you a timeline of studies that go back to about 1988 to 92, to studies around 1997, and then more, a little more recent studies, and then I don't have the, the paradigm trial, but there's the study released in 2015 for the drug Entresto. But the point is that people who are actively treated with these different medications that I showed you get substantial benefit in survival, much lower mortality rates. So the active treatment groups are the orange, the, the placebo groups, the people who got a sugar pill, so to speak, are in the gray. That Entresto drug, by the way, they had to stop that trial because so many people were surviving, it was unethical to continue it. <laughs> it's, it, it was that serious a, a difference and, and so powerful a medication in terms of its effect on patients with heart failure. And this is kind of another optimistic uh, slide from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the NIH, that looks at, look, looks at the mortality associated with heart failure per 100,000 people. And if you go back to 1950, you see what the mortality would be, you know, eight, 900 people per 100,000. But if you get out over here to 2015, look at the massive difference that's occurred. And that started happening about 1970. So we think that this, is, this change is probably related to fixing heart arteries, doing bypass operations. And then from about this point on, about 1980 on, this is the development of medications that will enhance survival. So this makes a pretty powerful point that if you pay attention to how you feel, you get attention, have your heart failure diagnosed, and get the proper treatments, we can afford people a substantial improvement in survival. A few other little, for, little, little tidbits about, ther about the therapy for heart failure. As it turns out, I told you about all kind of fancy stuff, billions of dollars spent on all that stuff I just described to you. And here's the most important part. And this part happens at home. You have to do something to change the program. Get rid of the boudin, the jambalaya, the, the, <laughs> the bisque, all the stuff. You've got to watch salt and water because this principally becomes a problem with you, the pump being weak. So you can't flood the pump. And the way you avoid flooding the pump is stay away from salt and you've got to stay away from water. This is a major issue, sodium. And this has become popular in this discussion about treatment for high blood pressure. But sodium is everywhere. Anything that's preserved, I'm, unfortunate, I'm, I have to tell you that everything you just ate is loaded with sodium. <laughs> Sodium is everywhere. It's not just in the salt shaker. People, a lot of people have the misconception that the salt shaker is the problem. No, it's not. It's the soda. It's the chips. It's the meat that's preserved. If it's not fresh, it's got sodium. If it's not, if it's not, not fresh, it's dangerous if you've got heart failure. Sodium causes you to retain water. You probably had the experience. You go to the movie theater, you buy your big bucket of, pop of popcorn full of salt and butter, and then you spend the next two days drinking water. That's all great if your heart's working like it's supposed to, but not so good if your heart function doesn't, heart doesn't work well. Diet is part of this, but what I'm alluding to here is doing the things that avoid or create a favorable environment in, in your body to keep from developing heart failure. So avoiding, using your diet to avoid diabetes to avoid hypercholesterolemia, things that would cause blocked arteries. This is really, really important. Exercise. Two, two of my favorite studies that, that have ever been published, other than that thing about Entresto that I alluded to, are two studies done by the World Health Organization. They were done, for, done looking at, at the effect for, of hormone therapy in women, published in 2000 and 2002. And they're called HERS, H-E-R-S, 1 and 2. Together, they had about 100, 150,000 patients involved. That's massive numbers of patients in the literature world. They looked at trying to give women hormone therapy to see if it would help pre prevent women from developing heart artery disease and strokes uh, like they were prevented from having heart disease and strokes before menopause. 
And unfortunately, what they showed was that there was no real effect. There's no, no beneficial effect. It actually, hormone therapy might be, might be harmful. We don't know. But out of that 100,000 patients, they, they set about playing statistical games. And lo and behold, they found 11,000 patients who they could track their activity level, their exercise. And guess what happened? If you took that 11,000 people who, who were exercising as in walking, walking, 30 to 45 minutes a day, five days a week, their mortality was 50% lower than the rest of the population. So remember the heart is a muscle and it can be conditioned and it can be conditioned even when it's not normal. So exercise becomes important. The smoking cessation, okay, just remember the, the, the image of gasoline and matches. And then alcohol limitation, and this has to do with, with blood pressure control and volume control. So a little bit about our heart failure clinic, and I'll wrap it up and, and, and let you ask questions. We have, it, it's both physician and nurse practitioner based, so, there, so we have physicians that are paying attention to the patients in the heart, clinic, heart failure clinic. You can be referred to the heart failure clinic by your cardiologist or by your primary care doctor. And then the, your care will be supervised by, by one of us, one of the cardiologists, as well as one of our two nurse practitioners who are very well trained at managing patients according to the guidelines. This is done in conjunction with your, your primary care doctor's care. Continual communication makes a big difference. We have the ability to, to give therapies, uh, particularly diuretics, uh, as an infusion, outpatient infusion, come in in the morning, go home in the afternoon. We have dietary counseling set up so that we can help people understand what's involved in, not, in avoiding salt and water and eating healthy. We have access to the advanced heart failure therapies, that's those LVADs and transplants, by collaborative arrangements with uh, the DeBakey Transplant Center at Methodist in Houston, uh, as well as uh, the folks in, at Oxford in New Orleans, and, and even, like as I mentioned, the, the folks at Duke. Uh, some psychosocial support. This becomes a pretty serious problem. Nobody likes having heart failure. And in fact, one of the hardest parts about this whole thing is, is helping people accept that there's a problem. You have to first understand that you have a problem and be willing to deal with it. And this is what this is all about. And then we're working toward developing access to the investigational therapies through our, our collaborative um, practice arrangements with the people in Houston and New Orleans, and et, et cetera. This is just a little reference to all those little graphics I, I showed you. The American Heart Association is where that dynamic picture uh, came from, and I would encourage you, if you have interest in heart failure, that they have lots of information on the American Heart Association website. That's aha.org. So with that, I can answer some questions.